way back to your seat, I just want to welcome you into the time where we're going to dive deep into the Word of the Lord. So if you've got a Bible from the Bible bookshelf or you have a digital device, uh, join me in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24. Matthew, Mark, Luke, third book, New Testament. And if you're using the Alive paperback, it's page 1060, 1060. And uh, we're going to look at about 20 verses out of there. And we're going to discover uh, some amazing things about what it means um, for us to be empty of a lot of things so that we can be filled with the things of Christ. It'll become more obvious in a second, but it's a great launch pad for moving into this new series. And maybe you've picked up some of the nuances already in the verses that you've heard, the prayers that we've experienced, and even uh, the songs that we've sung about how even our Lord Jesus Christ emptied himself of his equality with the Father, gave up his glory, considered it not to be something to be used for his own advantage so that he could become our Redeemer a perfect Lord. What does that look like in our lives? We're going to let the Word of God teach us today as we jump in. So join me uh, for a moment of prayer to ask God to bless His Word to accomplish His purposes. Let's pray together. Father God, we believe Your Word even from the prophet Isaiah who said that Your words go out to accomplish Your purposes and never return to You void. So send it here today to embed that truth in our hearts and in our lives that it might bear a harvest, a great harvest of righteousness, faith, and believing in us, that we will give you honor and glory in everything we think and say, believe, and do. Father, bless your word today as I speak it. Help me to be a good teacher and all of us to be hearers and doers of the word. We thank you, God, for how much you love us. Help us to love you back in Jesus' name. Amen. So this new series is called Empty, and that went out in the Pulse and already on our website uh, this past week. And we had a few replies already, like, what's, what's this all about? That's kind of like a weird name for a series, Empty. Um, and if you saw it on Facebook, one person even said, Alive isn't empty, you know, what's going on there? And it's not. In fact, there's a bunch of people watching online who can't see you. So give them a shout. Say good morning, everybody. Good morning. <laughs> yeah, we love you guys. We miss you. Uh, Brooke, if you're watching, your parents say hi, just so you know. Is that right? Paige, sorry, Paige, and your friend Brooke. <laughs> that was just so sad. You just told me like 14 <laughs> seconds ago. And I know Paige, they're our neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff was in my youth group right after I graduated from seminary. And uh, he came back to the Lord anyway. And <laughs> So this new series is um, it's thought-provoking at the very least. It gets you wondering about, is being empty a good thing or a bad thing, right? I mean, here's what I mean. You can have a full life, but it can work against you, actually. You can be full, and that can be dangerous. I've heard people say, well, my calendar is full, Pastor Terry. Um, I'm, just, I'm just way too busy. Um, I can't meet with you this week, or I can't serve on that team. Um, I just can't find the time for devotions or to read the Word of God. And uh, I've even heard people say that their calendars are too full to show up for worship on Sunday. They're full up. Jesus even told a parable one time about how people were too busy to come to his banquet. One had to tend his field, the other one had to try out his new oxen, the third one had just got married, and so they didn't even have time uh, to receive the invitation and show up for the banquet. They were too busy, their calendar was filled up, their attentions were full up, and they were filled with everything else but time with the Lord. Sometimes, Having a life that's too full is the problem. Just the same, a life that's empty can be a problem. We can be empty of understanding or courage or even purpose. Sometimes we're empty of hope and energy and joy and we have a listless experience. When we experience a disconnect in our lives, when what we believe and hope for doesn't match our experience, when a disconnect for us is that severe, when our life doesn't match our beliefs, it's hard to keep believing. It's hard to stay in the game, to stay engaged in the Christian life. Some people just think it's not worth it anymore, so they pack up their stuff and go home. I understand how that happens. I understand why people feel that way. Sometimes our plans for our life don't work out. Sometimes the things that we had hoped for, hope beyond hope, don't come to be. I know some of those seasons where you pray and you pray and you pray and it seems like nothing happens. 
when everything evaporates and you are empty, then what? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? I understand how it happens, but how does it unhappen? I mean, how does a life that's too full of things that keep us from Jesus become empty, empty to make room for spending time with him? Or how does being empty, like without hope or just giving up and having no kingdom vision and no energy, how does that turn into running towards him, to run with so much energy that you're able to get up and run seven miles to tell your friends what you've learned about Jesus? This is exactly what happened in the text today. It's what happened to some followers of Jesus. They were full of hope and vision and joy and commitment, and they were willing to follow him anywhere. They were on fire. But then they saw him die on the cross, and then he was buried. And they were told that he had risen from the dead, and some of them went to look, but they didn't find him. They couldn't prove it. And so their hope drained out. They were completely empty. They couldn't understand the disconnect from what they believed and what they experienced was so severe, it's like they lost their purpose. Everything they thought they believed didn't seem to make sense anymore. So they got up, they packed up, and went home. Empty of full, empty of hope, but full of confusion. The super part is we're only going to look at 20 verses today, maybe 21, and we're going to watch them go from emptiness to fullness. So full, they actually get up and run seven miles to tell people that Jesus is alive. They show up full of understanding about why Jesus had to die, and then they live their life telling everyone they know. So let's see how emptiness and hopelessness unhappens, how they went from being full to empty to be filled again. Here's their story. Luke chapter 24, let's pick it up at verse 13. If you're ready to jump in the word, say, yep. Here's the word of the Lord. Now that same day, so this is Resurrection Sunday. Here it is, first day, Jesus had risen. He'd shown himself to a few people already. This is when uh, Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, went to the tomb. The angel told him that he had risen, and then they went back and told the guys, and they went running and didn't find him, and so they were, everybody was confused. That same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. These are the two guys. I think they're guys. We only know one. His name is Cleopas. Um, these were two people who were heading home. We're going to learn in a minute that they were hopeless. They were downcast. Their faces were downcast. And to me, it seems like they had given up. Their experience over this past week seems to have erased everything from the past three years of walking with Jesus. And now it's like show over, fade to black, scene done. Here we go. Let's just go home. We're going to see, we're going to hear them talk back and forth. They're going to talk, uh, they're going to uh, talk as they walk. And the word there that we're going to uh, appear, it's going to appear in the text just a minute, is the word for volley, like volleyball back and forth over the net. And it's kind of what you do when your hope crashes into a thousand pieces. You talk it through like, what in the world just happened? Let's pick it up at verse 14. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. And as they talked and discussed, there's that word. It means to volley back and forth, to reason or dispute. You can almost hear them saying, nuh-uh, this is what he said, or uh-uh, this is what he meant. You can almost hear them going back and forth. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. Literally, it's their eyes were held shut, held from knowing that it was him. I stopped here because I wondered why in the world would someone be kept from knowing Jesus when he's standing right next to them? I mean, isn't now, right now, today, the best time to know that Jesus is walking with you? It seems like it, right? But I wonder, uh, you know, so I'm a parent and a grandparent, and I know a couple of things, two or three maybe, about um, helping people learn. And I've been a disciple maker. I've been in ministry for 40 years, and and then there's other things because I've been discipled my whole life. I know that sometimes you just walk with people to help them finally get it, right? To process their questions. That's what's going on here, right? Maybe there's stuff that we don't know about the whole, how the Holy Spirit works in someone's heart and mind. Maybe there's value in wrestling with your thoughts and processing your questions and actually saying it out loud so that you not only understand, but when you finally get it, it sticks. 
We want to be enduring believers, so let's deal with our questions. I want you to know, as your pastor, that God's shoulders are big enough to handle every question you have about life and about who he is and about how you should live. Give him the question. I promise he has the answer. Maybe these two characters in Scripture who are headed towards Emmaus, maybe they needed some time. They had to work through their process of frustration, like what in the world just happened? We thought he was the one, and now he's gone. So they had to clear up all that clutter rolling around in their minds. They had to have room to consider some things because they were full, full of doubt and misunderstanding that needed to be emptied out. They had to get their arguments and disagreements out of the way and own their emptiness. And isn't that a great place to start a spiritual journey? God, I bring nothing. Everything I thought that I understood, I just, I don't. Everything that I thought made me valuable and worthy before you isn't. God, it's, it's just me here before you because you're everything and you love me anyway. Does that make sense? Say yes. That's what this is about. They needed to be filled with understanding and here's how Jesus taught them. Jump in at verse 17. Remember Jesus shows up next to them, kind of out of nowhere, and he asks them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? Same word. What are you guys volleying back and forth? What is this that I hear? I mean, you can imagine they're even talking at the same time. I don't know. And they stood still. That question was enough to make them stop in their tracks. They stood still. And here's that downcast. Their faces downcast. The old word is countenance, right? How you look. You can tell when someone is, like, feels heavy or sad or they're trying to figure things out. They stood still, their faces down, heavy with the fullness of their frustration. One of them, named Cleophas, asked him, I don't know, did he have his arms crossed? Did he, I don't know what the Greek word is, but did he go, like, you don't know? That's what he said, right? Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have happened there in these days? And the irony is, is just awesome. Uh, Jesus knows everything. He knows all about all the understanding of what just happened, and these guys were there, and they don't know anything, and they go, are you the only one? Hmm. So he helps them. Verse 19, what things? He asked. See, he wants them to get it out, to process. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. I mean, they knew Jesus. They were followers, probably, believers, probably, but empty of understanding, full of experience, but they couldn't put it together. Their experience didn't match what they knew. So now they're gushing out all their dashed hopes. You can imagine how this is, right? Maybe both together. Well, he was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and the rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what's more, it's the third day since all this took place. So you and I, we're living now, a couple thousand years ago, that was like saying, and not only is he dead, he's really for sure dead. Because when, when you're in the tomb three days, that's, that's it. There's no resuscitation. There's, there's no way you're faking it. It's the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and they told us that they had seen visions of angels who said he was alive. And then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they didn't see Jesus. Imagine their frantic frustration, trying to get all those words out. I bet they were talking 100 miles an hour to this new listener who had joined their conversation. And when they finally breathed, and made enough room for Jesus to speak, he connected the dots for them, helping them to understand their experience of his death and resurrection. You see, here is the word of the Lord, the living word, Jesus Christ. They didn't have the New Testament yet. So he helped them to understand gospel. The word of the Lord is with them. And he showed them the meaning of the scriptures they already knew, the Old Testament law and prophets. Verse 25, this is Jesus speaking. He said to them, how foolish you are and slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. I mean, how is it that you can be so familiar with a word, it's hidden in your heart and you've memorized it and you can, you can speak Torah word for word and you recite it and you repeat it out loud time and time again, but the dots don't come together. How is it that you're slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken? 
Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And in that one sentence, the whole Old Testament prophecy and the law and all of the festivals and the sacrificial system comes together in gospel. Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God who was sacrificed to take away the sins of the world and he rose from the dead to conquer sin, death, and hell and was ascended that our body, our flesh, might be in eternal heaven now and one day he's coming back to take us to be with him. Amen? it's all in one sentence and so he puts a, a bow around it and ties it up for them and beginning with Moses verse 27 and all the prophets he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself they knew all the scriptures and now he pointed it to him the resurrected Messiah slow to believe means slow to understand and when we can't understand believing and faith is hard. Look what Jesus did. He took them on an Old Testament survey course so they could understand him, the New Testament. Slowly helping them connect what they knew to what they had just experienced. And, and it made them want more, more understanding, more fellowship, more of Jesus. And maybe we're exactly the same. I mean, we know stuff. We believe but then there's life. And sometimes it doesn't seem to fit what we believe or what we had hoped for. And we become empty. And hope and purpose and energy and joy just drain out. And our prayers don't seem to go past the ceiling. And we open the Bible and nothing happens in our heart. Or maybe we just don't understand what it says. And maybe like Cleopas and the other one were tempted to pack it up and walk home. I'm glad for Jesus' patience and the way he treats us when we don't get it. Imagine if he would just, in a harumph, turn around and walk away and say, I can't believe it. I mean, I'm 62, right? Imagine if he would say to me, Terry, I've been speaking to you through the word for 62 years. You are so dense. I bet all you tell is dad jokes. What we know about Jesus is he is patient and kind and gentle and humble in spirit, trusting his Holy Spirit to slowly fill us up with understanding in his word. Look at how the flame in their hearts, what they knew, became a fire. You can almost feel the heat from the scripture as that fire grows. Chapter 24, verse 28, as they approached the village to which they were going, headed back to Emmaus, Jesus continued on as if he was going further. But they urged him strongly, can you feel it? Here's the fire. No, no, we want more. When you talk, we, we understand. They urged him strongly, stay with us. It's nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. He had just taught them while they walked, and now he's going to behave in a very familiar way to them. Now their experience is starting to reconnect with their belief. By spending more time with Jesus, they understand more of Jesus. Verse 30, so he was at the table with them, and when he was, he took bread, he gave thanks, and broke it, and began to give it to them. And they've seen this before. They know what this is. Verse 31, then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and then he disappeared from their sight. When our understanding and our experience come back together from spending time with Jesus, our eyes are open and we're filled with understanding. So they asked each other. This time, literally, it's a different word. The other word was they talked to each other or whatever. Um, uh, that word for volley, right, back and forth, disagreement, debate, whatever that was, this is the word for to speak with conclusion. Like, I knew it. That's the word. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? Their eyes were opened, and now they can draw conclusions. Their eyes were opened, and now they have answers for their questions. Jesus led them through a deep process of figuring it out. He taught them with the word about the word. He taught them with the Old Testament to understand that he is the new covenant. This is the epitome of discipleship. 
if we want to understand Jesus, we got to be with Jesus in his word. Amen? It's how he brings understanding. Look what happens. They were too excited to just sit at home with this new understanding, so they get up and run seven miles back to Jerusalem. Verse 33, they got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. And there they found the 11 and those with them assembled together. And they were already talking. Remember, because the women had gone to the tomb and came back and Peter and John went to the tomb and came back. So they were already, and Jesus showed up to Peter. They were already sharing all their stories and testimonies, volleying, trying to figure it out. And they were saying, it's true, the Lord has risen. And he's appeared to Simon Peter. So now Cleopas and the other one show up. Verse 35, then the two uh, told them what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. And now the same thing that happened to Cleopas and the other, the walking and talking and figuring it out, figuring out your frustrations and your questions to get understanding, now that same thing happens to the whole group. Not just to Peter, not just to Cleopas and that other one, but to all of them together, cementing their understanding for enduring believing. So while they're giving testimonies, Jesus shows up, just like he did with Cleopas and the other. While they were discussing, Jesus showed up, and he teaches them from the word and has fellowship with them to prove that he's for real risen. Basically, he's connecting the dots, helping them understand or connect their faith with their experience. So listen, verse 36. While all of them were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said, peace be with you. They were startled and frightened. They thought they saw a ghost. And he said to them, why are you troubled? Why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I, myself. Touch me and see. A ghost doesn't have flesh and bones as you see I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still didn't believe, because of great joy and amazement, he asked them a question. Remember, he's the teacher. He's the rabbi. So he asks them a question. Do you have anything to eat? Kind of a random thought, isn't it? I mean, right in the middle of worship, of showing who he is. Hey, uh, anybody got a snack? You got anything to eat? So they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. You see, it wasn't so random. He was helping them discover that he was real, truly risen. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ standing there with them. He aided in their presence and said this, verse 44, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Lord Jesus, send your Holy Spirit to us right now that we might understand the things that you've already told us so that we might know you and believe and understand that you are the Lamb of God who gave your life, that we might have life. This is what I told you is anybody ever, I mean, I grew up in Sunday school, right? I'm, I'm old enough. We used to have that pin at the top here, and then it was a little bars underneath for every year that you completed and all that kind of stuff. Mine was um, short, but I learned a lot that one year and, and all three years of third grade. And um, maybe you're like me and you know a lot of stuff. I mean, I grew up in a, in a believing family. I've had the word of the Lord open in my home and in my heart my whole life. I don't know a moment that I didn't know Jesus. And he still says to me, this is what I told you when I was with you. Do you ever have that epiphany, that moment? It's like, yes, now I get it. I mean, read the book of Hebrews this fall. Just plow through it, and you will understand the, New Test or the Old Testament in a whole new light. The whole sacrificial system that was to teach us about the sacrifice of Christ, Israel didn't understand. They killed the Messiah. This is what I told you when I was with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms. And now we get to my favorite part. When, they're at the, when Jesus was at the home in Emmaus, um, he, the scripture says he opened their eyes. They were able to understand, connect the dots, put it together. Their questions now had answers, and so they got up and ran. And here in this room, right, they were up there, uh, the disciples, the others with them, um, testimonies about Jesus showing up to Peter, and now Jesus is there. Everyone's gathered. They've heard the testimonies of those eyewitnesses. Jesus shows them his scars. He eats some broiled fish, and here he does that same thing again. He opens their minds so they can understand what was empty and void, that space left behind when their hope and their understanding drained out. Now he fills it up. And they're finally able to receive a filling of the Holy Spirit. Listen, verse 45. Then he opened their minds 
so they could understand the scriptures. It's a beautiful word, opened. It means fully open. Uh, in Greek, it means literally all the way across, uh, like if it were a, um, like a river valley and you had a cliff in a cliff, all the way across from point A to point B, the whole thing. Um, everything necessary to complete the process. It's wide open, ready to receive understanding. If, if you're like me, I love gra graph paper and there's dots. Remember that old game we used to play? Draw a dot at every intersection and then you could draw one line at it. It's like the whole thing is filled in. All the dots are connected so that the scripture says they could understand. That's our word for synthesize. It means put it all together. And you go, oh, so that's what that means. And now they know how to live. Now they can see the big picture, not just the pixels, but God's story of redemption. I love this part because you can almost feel the percussion of their understanding when all the lights come on simultaneously. I can imagine their eyes getting bigger and bigger, leaning in closer and closer so they could hear more and more of what Jesus was saying. Their heart rate's increasing, their breathing getting faster, and finally they're able to understand what God is doing. They get a handle on the gospel story so they can carry it to the world and tell everyone else. It's exactly what Jesus told them to do with their understanding. He said, go and tell, listen. Verse 46, so he said, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. There's that third day again. <laughs> and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And you are my witnesses of these things. I'm going to send you what my Father has promised. So this is a pre-Pentecost promise from Jesus that the Holy Spirit would be poured out on the New Testament church. I'm going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in this city until you've been clothed with power from on high. And we know that just 50 days later, a few weeks later, there was Pentecost, and the power of the Spirit was poured out on every believer, and the New Testament church began as we know it today. This is awesome to ha see how Jesus fills up empty disciples. Little by little, with gentleness and patience, so we're not overwhelmed. We have time to process and think and figure it out and see the dots connect. The same thing that happened in Emmaus and in the room in Jerusalem will happen for us. We have questions and disconnected dots. We can see life as pixelated and confusing, like how does this experience match what I know or believe? And Jesus shows up to teach them from his word, and he started with Old Testament law, prophets, and psalms. Who would have guessed that Jesus' primary strategy for give, giving us understanding was to be in the Word? Secondly, those same people, they had fellowship with Jesus, right? Whether it was in the room and he ate the broiled fish or whether it was in Emmaus and they, he broke bread with them, they broke bread together, ate fish, they touched him because the more fellowship you have with Jesus, the more understanding and faith you have. In the Word, in fellowship with Jesus, is how he opens our minds and our eyes so we can understand who he is and believe the gospel. And when those two things are true, when we're in the Word and we're given understanding, we'll go tell someone. We'll get up and run seven miles talking over everyone else so that our testimony can be heard. It's the commission that all believers have to be his witnesses right here and to the ends of the earth. They were full of confusion and questions empty of hope and purpose until Jesus gave them understanding to be full of the Holy Spirit and to live out their missional purpose because we know God's promise that he sends out his word and it will never return to him void. It feels a lot like our missional practices of how we accomplish our values here at Alive. Look at these words on the screen. Our first missional practice is that I am in the word Gainer and reformed identity in Christ by the work of the Holy Spirit who lives in me so I can keep in step with his will. This is what it takes to get understanding and to live a life on mission and on purpose. We call it bringing life into our communities. We need to be in the word, in fellowship with Jesus, so we can be empty of ourselves, our questions and doubts, and be filled with the Holy Spirit and understanding. It's really that simple. It's so straightforward. We are blessed to be a blessing. We are loved so we can love others and we have understanding so we can walk with someone so they will understand just like Jesus did. It sounds a lot like relational discipleship, doesn't it? It's what Brian has been talking about. 
The context is relationships to walk and eat and have fellowship with so that we can talk about questions and about frustrations and how our experience doesn't match at all what the church is saying and then let Jesus pour in his understanding. Our uh, missional confession really helps us understand it and it's on the walls. You see it just about everywhere you go. Here it is quickly, it's on the screen. I'm connecting with Christ and others by developing authentic relationships with Jesus in my community for the sake of the gospel. Secondly, I'm growing in grace and knowledge and increasingly being conformed to his likeness, knowing that because he loved me first, I must love others. And thirdly, I'm intentionally going into my community, sharing their burdens in order that I might bring life. I'm connecting, growing, and going. Isn't that exactly what we saw in the scripture today? Connecting with Christ, gaining understanding as when we're in fellowship with him, and then getting up to go tell someone. As we think about sign-up season starting in a couple of weeks, what would it mean if all of us prioritized being in the Word together? Not just for the sake of duty. And we don't need any more Sunday school pins. I mean, what would it mean if we all prioritized the Word to know God and His Son and let the Holy Spirit teach us and make sense of our life to draw the lines between our experience and the Word so we can be on mission and bring life? It changed the lives of everyone in Luke 24, and it will change ours too. Jesus engaged his followers with his word so we can go out to engage the world with his word. I challenge all of us to get into the word however we can in a group and in private devotions and study, in worship, all of it as much as you can so that your eyes will be open and your mouth will be filled with a testimony to share the stories of God's salvation. And today, if you're full of hopelessness, or maybe just it doesn't make sense, you don't understand, or even how you're to live your life, he has a word for you, and he is your teacher. So spend time with him. Spend time with him in his word. It's how he speaks most clearly most often. And that will give you something to talk about when you tell others about who he is. I promise. And as we bring life into our communities, God will draw to himself all those that he's chosen to spend eternity with him. Let's let that drive us today. Yeah? All right. We're off to a great fall season. Let's pray together. Father God, uh, we know your word. Help us to understand it. We believe and we have hope. And sometimes we have to hope even beyond because it doesn't make sense. So I pray that you will help us, Lord Jesus. Open our eyes that we might have understanding. Open our minds so we can understand the scripture. You are the answer to our questions, the truth to all the lies. You are the life for every death. So Lord Jesus, make yourself known to us today as we have fellowship with you, whether it's in communion like last week or in the fellowship of believers or the fellowship of being in the word or in a group or in a study, whatever it is, Lord, I pray that you will be obvious for us, that you will be evident to us, that the scales from our eyes will quickly fall away and we will see you, Jesus. That anything that's in our heart that keeps us from understanding your word, that it will just dissolve before the warmth of your glory and light. And that we will just have an enduring love and a passion to have more and more and more of you. To have such a hunger for the bread of life, for the word that we just, that's it. That's all we need in the desert. God, so I pray a blessing on every student as they've begun their school year. I pray for Grand Valley State University that you will make that campus and that place and especially campus ministry to be a sanctuary and a safe place for the gospel to go out to find tender hearts, to do your work, your purposes, Lord Jesus. That we would trust you, that there would be believing and more believing and baptisms and testimonies of faith. So I pray a blessing upon the, the students that are here today, no matter what campus they're on, whether it's grade school or middle school or high school or university, Father, I pray a blessing on them. Father, that they will grow up to know you, love you, and serve you every day. God, that you would be the answer to their question and the hope for their future. That you would send peace for their frustrations. Give them resources that they have margin to pursue you and seek your face. So bless their pastors and teachers, Father God. I bless those who are uh, professors and, and administrators in all those places too, Lord, that they might have courage and truth father that they might be bold and have patient love like you do for us bless moms and dads as they try and maintain that schedule of getting up early and 
putting the scripture on the doorposts and on their foreheads and on their hands that they might talk about you when they rise or lie down, when they sit down or stand up and walk by the way, Lord. May we be like you and just talk about you. Help us to recall your word, whether it's prophecy or, or psalm, whatever it is. May your law be written on the flesh of our hearts that we might live pleasing before you. So God, as we jump into this new year, uh, help us. Help us to consecrate and dedicate ourselves to you. God, you're worth it. You're worth more than anything. You are the treasure hidden in the field. You're worth just giving up everything else to follow you. So help us to do that. I thank you, God, for your word. I thank you that it's a light and a lamp. It directs our steps and our feet. Help all of us, Lord, to live accordingly. We dedicate ourselves and pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I'll invite you, if you're able, stand for singing.